Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range technical forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Now, there are three places around the world that I'm very concerned about drought right now. The first is going to be in eastern Ukraine and the Russian wheat belt. The second is going to be in South America, which I'm going to talk about in tomorrow morning's uh, U.S. Global Outlook. And then the third is what's going on right here in the southern plains of the United States over toward the four corner states in California. Of course, the onset of precipitation in California is very late. It usually begins at some point in early October, and there are some places in California we haven't measured any precip. It's been very dry in the four corner states, and where we're trying to get a winter wheat crop established in the southern plains it's been dry there as well. Pockets of the Corn Belt over the last 30 days still show up dry. And the question is, is the pattern we're seeing right now going to change any of this? So let's get right into it and talk about that pattern. Now, the thing you're probably seeing, first of all, is what's over here in the Atlantic. And flanking the United States, there's two very interesting features. And again, the one in the Atlantic is Hurricane Epsilon, which thankfully is going to stay away from the United States. On the other side, though, we have a blocked up pattern. We have a high over low setup here. And what that's going to do is that blocking setup is going to take this ridge right here and amplify it, push it more toward the Gulf of Alaska, more toward British Columbia. The downstream trough, which is right here, anchored on some very cold air tucked away in the Canadian prairies in the northern plains of the United States, this is going to start to shift and move south. And as it does that, we're going to initially get a big snowstorm that's going to come right in through this area. And then as this trough potentially pinches off down here over the southwestern United States, we're going to have to see what this means for increasing precipitation chances in California, the four corner states, and possibly the southern plains of the United States. We've got snow and severe weather to be talking about with this pattern, so let's get right into it and assess where it's going going. So here's the same thing, but now what we're looking at here is uh, the troughs and ridges shown to you in colors. So here's our ridge we're going to watch amplify into western Canada, and I want you to see what happens with this trough as I let this go forward. So let's pause it here. We just watched this play through Wednesday into Thursday and Friday. Now my first concern is going to be on Thursday. You see, coming around the base of this trough, there is a short wave, and therefore there's great vorticity advection out ahead of it. Now what that means is we're going to help destabilize the upper levels of the atmosphere over parts of Iowa, where we're going to see a warm front advance out of the south and give us a, a, a pretty good chance into this area of thunderstorms, some of which could be severe. But as we go past Thursday into the weekend, the next thing I want to watch most carefully emerges Friday night into Saturday morning, and it's right here. You see, the European model is offering a very unique view of what could possibly happen this weekend into early next week, in that it is separating this trough from this one. Now, this second trough, the one I'm pointing to right here, is going to be on the back side, and it's going to be drawn down toward parts of Nevada, eventually into parts of maybe California in Arizona. And you can see that by the time I take you out to Monday afternoon, the trough is well established here. And also there's a secondary piece of it here. And these two features are not necessarily working in tandem. And that's because the flow's got to come over this big ridge and it might cut right in between the two things here. Now, if that happens, that will allow this trough to slowly move from Southern California and Arizona through the four corner states and emerge into the Southern Plains where it could increase the chances of precipitation next week. But the GFS has a little bit different scenario, which I'm gonna to explain to you in just a few moments here. First things first, before that trough digs in, we do have to be on the lookout right in through this area for the potential for some um, snow. Let me draw that again in black, right in through here. We have winter storm watches out for here, winter weather advisories in parts of Montana, and the potential for picking up several inches of snow is quite high. Uh, air quality issues still plaguing California, Utah, and parts of Colorado, but we will be seeing a major change in the flow pattern into this area in the coming days. And this, by the way, is a freeze watch in this part of Kansas. All right, let's take a look at those temperatures first. This is the max temperatures for Wednesday. I just want to play this forward for you so you can see what happens Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Look at that. That's a big change in the temperature pattern across the mid part of the United States. But taking you back right here, this is Thursday. On Thursday, there's going to be a warm front that advances right in through this area, bringing with it temperatures that could be in the middle 80s, right in through the area that I'm kind of highlighting in this uh, particular spot of the U.S. But look at the sharp divide here in temperature. There's going to be a strong cold front that comes racing through that after Thursday getting into Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we could have temperatures here 
in the teens for highs on Sunday. That's more than 40 degrees colder than normal as some of that cold air is let out as the trough amplifies. Now, remember, we're going to watch out for the severe weather first. So tomorrow on Thursday, you can see right in through here, the Storm Prediction Center is keeping an eye out, giving a marginal risk for severe storms. And our, even our severe weather index is putting the warm front through first, bringing chances of scattered storms. And then as the cold front comes swiping through, that's really going to increase the threat for strong to severe storms right again through this corridor and through here. Let me show you that by looking at the high resolution NAM model. We'll play this out first so you can see this all take place. While snow builds in parts of Montana and the Dakotas initially in this forecast, watch this. Here it comes. This is a Wednesday evening. We can see right in through here, scattered storms on the nose of that warm front moving forward. But here's that snow I was mentioning. See it coming in this part uh, of, uh, of the Dakotas. But right in through here, we're going to watch out tomorrow morning for scattered showers and storms. And as the front comes blazing through here tomorrow evening, that's where we're going to have to watch for our best chance of strong to severe storms along this main frontal boundary. That'll push Thursday night into Friday morning all the way to Friday evening across uh, much of the central part of the United States through the Great Lakes states. And our next system starts to take shape here. That's that potential cutoff now coming through parts of the Pacific Northwest. So that's where the story gets really interesting from this point forward. Okay, I want to just give you the big picture. When we look over the next seven days, the West Coast, especially when you are on the western side of the mountains here, Northern California and the Cascades, is going to be dry. That's because the ridge is building in like this. But you can see that on the east-facing slopes, look right here, of the Cascade Mountains getting into the Columbia Basin, the northern Rockies, and then in Montana, better chances of snow. And that's because the trough comes in from this angle. Now that trough eventually comes all the way down here to Southern California and sets up right in through this area. And that's what increases the chances of rain and snow through the four corner states and possibly Southern California. Now, as the first system cuts through here, bringing in our chances, and I'll show you that, we will see the establishment of a ridge over the southeast. So that's going to take the flow around it and kind of let it park right here on a stationary boundary. Now, why talk about that? Well, remember back from the first image, this was an area that actually had been quite dry as well over the last 30 days. And harvest pace has been breakneck because of that. Now, with the potential this fall of doing some application, which we didn't have in 18 or 19 because of how wet it was or how late the harvest was, this rain is going to be good for bringing up the soil moisture such that when we go to put on that anhydrous, we're going to have the moisture to kind of keep the soil together to fold it back on top uh, of the anhydrous once it's put down. So there's some benefit to this, although it could possibly disrupt some late harvest efforts. Okay, that's the pattern as it's setting up. From there, I want to show you some snow maps. Now, this is going to be my... my I just want to tell you, this is going to be something we're going to talk about a lot this winter. I'll show you the raw model output, but I want you to remember that models, when it comes to predicting snow, oftentimes maybe get the placement right, but do not get the amounts right. So let's not look at this for amounts. Let's look at this for track, the placement. And you can see that both the GFS and the European are favoring this corridor in through here as having the heaviest snows here in the near term. Possibly parts, I don't know, right in here into the Dakotas and northern Minnesota, there could easily be an area that's going to be getting six plus inches of snowfall. Now look at what the European model says as the trough finally digs into California, comes into Arizona. This area up in the mountains could possibly see quite a bit of snow as well. Now, the GFS, which is over here on the left, has a little bit different scenario. You're saying, well, where's that snow here, and why am I seeing more of it there when compared to the European? Well, the answer to that is actually seen by the difference in the pattern by the time we get to Sunday, Monday. GFS is on the left. Can you see the difference here? The main trough is all connected which means it's going to sweep through quicker and increase the chances of bringing in that colder air and therefore the snow into Iowa like you saw on the previous map. See it right there? But the European has a much different scenario because it cuts this trough off from the main trough here. So there's separation and the flow wants to go right in between the two. So this is going to allow this to linger and slowly come out of the southern plains. And that is the one that's going to give you better chances of snow throughout the four corner states and better chances of rainfall here in the southern plains where we desperately need it. Now, what are the temperatures going to do? What's well, interesting, the ensembles both suggest that the changing of the position at trough really drops a lot of cold air into the central part of the United States while keeping this warmth here over part of the southeast. 
From there, though, by the time we get out to day 10, both models want to take the trough and let it go through Canada, get out here into the open Atlantic south of Greenland and start to bring in more ridging. You can see it in both models, more ridging into the west that spreads into the central U.S., Translation, some of the warmth we expect to see here will begin to move once we get into November farther to the east. Precipitation, well, that pattern says in the GFS, wet here along the east coast. The European, which is slower in the progression, just has a broader area into week two that's showing up wet. But certainly throughout much of the northern half of California and then into the rest of the Pacific Northwest, things do look drier as we get out here to begin the month of November. Okay, that's the near-term things that I'm watching. What are we watching in the long term? Well, in last video analysis, we did a lot in our long range with La Nina. This one I want to talk more about MJO. If there is another feature that is predictive on seasonable on season seasonal, excuse me, time scales, it's going to be the MJO. So we've noticed that over the last month and a half, the MJO has been sitting here in phase four or five. All right. It's come out here high amplitude into phase five and is expected to go here uh, into phase sixes and seven. Now, what does that mean? Well, if it's been over there in phase four, phase four is right here. And as a result of being in phase four and now into phase five, we've seen a lot of upward motion uh, in this area and then more sinking motion in other places like over here and over here. So we're just looking at how the atmosphere is breathing across the tropics. If it's rising in this area, well, a lot of clouds and precipitation where it's been sinking, it has been drier. Now keep that in mind. So the MJO is going to move. What's the other component to this? Well, it's going to be the jet stream. So the MJO is a tropical feature over the last month. So the 19th of September through the 19th of October, we've continued to see troughs developing here in the Gulf of Alaska and then a downstream one right here, really through the Canadian prairies into uh, the Hudson Bay. And there's been a big ridge over the West. So the flow has done this. And that is what's kept the West, the Southwest and the South Central so dry and then brought things here through uh, into the Northeast. So these are our two pieces, the tropics and the subtropics. We're looking for changes away from this or persistence in this pattern. Now, let me show you what this has done. Coming to the United States, this map shows globally, first of all, uh, the last 30 days in terms of percent, or excuse me, precipitation anomalies. So drier and wetter based on the color scale. Now, you, you just saw that I said right here, this area has good upper level convergence and it has been dry in that area, as you can see. As the flow comes into the northwest, yeah, it's been wetter there. And we've had tropical systems in the southeast. Something else to note, you can almost see it here, but you see the trough over Europe? Look at what it's done here. Very wet in this region, but dry in the Black Sea region and the southern Russian wheat belt. But coming back to that discussion on the MJO, remember I said it's been sitting over this area. Look at how wet things have been in through here over the last month, where they've been dry in parts of South America as well. That's the explanation I want you to get. Now, moving forward, the MJO is going to shift over into phases seven and eight, which means it's going to start to move in this direction. That's going to help support upper level motion here. And that's going to be critical. And we'll talk about this more tomorrow to the resurgence of moisture in the Brazilian monsoon. But the bigger feature still is this La Nina. So how do we relate La Nina and MJO? Well, we know that this La Nina is getting stronger. Right now, the ocean temperatures are almost down to one and a half degrees Celsius below normal. And because of that, we've seen strong easterly trade winds in through this area here. But then coming out of the Indian Ocean, can you see the reds in this area? We've had strong um, uh, westerly wind bursts. So if the trade winds are coming in like this and the westerlies are coming in like that, this is the area where the air converges at the surface and it's forced to rise in there. That's what La Nina has been doing. It's been keeping the MJO somewhere over there in phase four, five, and six as of late. Now, here's what I want to do. If we expect this La Nina to continue to strengthen through December, but maybe reach a peak in December, okay, and then begin to wane in uh, January, February, March, what does that mean in terms of its relationship with the uh, MJO? Now, I want to give you a quick review. I told you last time that if we just let the... Um, we just correlate December through March with La Nina, it tends to keep a big ridge here. The flow comes over like that and skirts along the northern part of the United States. And we discussed what that meant because with our developing La Nina, we picked out a series of analog years. Remember this last time on which we were going to base our upcoming forecast. I'll show you those years in just a few seconds. Here they are. 1996, 99, 
06, 08, 11, and 17. Those being the, uh, you know, the, the, the second half of winter years. So we got cold air coming in here, but it was warm along the south. The trough parked over uh, the, the western part of North America with the ridge in the uh, here uh, south of the Aleutian Islands. So the jet stream did this, right? Okay, from there, we got this. Wetter here, wetter there, and cooler shots of air sliding in through this area, but warm along the south. Okay, remember that? Because it was in both models. Dry here, wet, wet, cold coming in like this at times, warm along the south. That was a review of what we talked about last time. Here's what I want to add to this. I wrote some code uh, early this morning that tried to understand the MJO and its phase. You know, it has eight different phases for our La Nina winters, uh, for those strong analog years, and just our normal La Nina winters. And I just wanted to see, did they have a preferred phase? Well, what I found was it's preferred phases when it's just normal La Nina is really here. It's five, six, and seven. And during those analog years, which I just listed off for you, it's also, you know, five and six with possibly even seven as well. So here's the lesson. I know there's a lot of maps up there, but if you've got phase five for uh, winter, phase six and phase seven, do you see here how for Dis uh, November and December, that's what we're looking at, November and December, that we tend to get, doesn't matter what the lag is, we tend to get a lot of cold air uh, in place right in through here. You can see it and it pushes through the country. You see, if we continue to have the MJO hanging out over there in five, six, and seven, that's going to reinforce uh, the pattern that we've recently had, which is all the cold air in this area. And by the way, these two maps on the bottom show you the forecast for the next month by the GFS on the right and the European on the left. They're both pretty much painting the same kind of story here. Now, understand they're mostly contaminated by the next 10 days. So I imagine the pattern will move. But what you do when you try to interpret this analysis is just read down here with me. If La Nina dominates the MJO behavior, then our early winter pattern in November and December is really going to favor a lot of North American cold snaps, like I've circled up there on the top maps and that circle down there on the bottom maps. I want you to understand, though, this isn't going to be like this every day. The, the pattern will move, but it may prefer this with time. So that would say that we're going to continue to see what we've been seeing lately as we progress into our early uh, uh, winter here. Okay. What about beyond that? Well, the analogs with the MJO doesn't really show a strong signal when we get out to January, February, March. I see peaks here around phase two and again around phase seven. But if I had to look at this and say, well, what is it really telling me? It's telling me that it avoids kind of phase five a lot. Okay. It doesn't prefer phase five. Now, remember during winter, other big features like the Arctic Oscillation tend to dominate what's going on with our temperature and precipitation patterns. But I'd like to show you what happens in Phase 5. You see, Phase 5 tends to feature big ridges over the eastern part of North America. Can you see it there? And those big ridges over the eastern part of North America uh, tend to really keep the jet stream north and keep everything warm. Now, remember, our analog analysis says better to keep more troughs here and more zonal flow across the U.S. And what I'm saying is, is that if we avoid phase five, this is the more likely scenario going forward in the forecast. So if we take all of that and do something with it, I want you to remember that La Nina and its relationship to the MJO is not overly strong. In other words, it's not strongly correlated, but we're breaking each one of these things down as we build this picture out for winter. So if you'd like an explanation on why the NOAA long range forecast for winter looks like this for temperature on the left and, uh, on, and per precipitation on the right, it's because they, like many of us, are seeing that La Nina will likely be the most dominant factor. And if it is, then it's going to look something like this, cold along the northern tier of the U.S., warm across the south, dry across the south, and, and, and wet across the north, also wet in the Ohio River Valley. But I just want you to remember something. What often makes a winter memorable is not the long-term pattern, but those polar vortex disruptions or big changes in the NAO. But I'll tell you this. If we have a La Nina, which we are forecasting, but the polar vortex never breaks down and the NO stays positive, these forecasts are going to bust. All right. 
And that's just, just how difficult it is when we do these long-range forecasting. Now, that's not me calling out Noah because you saw my forecast looks just like Noah's. Uh, but I'm just telling you, my forecast is going to bust if those two features, which are sub-seasonal, don't adjust. So we'll keep building this picture together. Hopefully you found this instructive and useful. Uh, but, you know, it's a bit of a mystery we're trying to unravel here. So I'll stop there and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks.